hey hi guys i hope the fixed income and equity uh, revision video for the august exam was useful i've got some comments on my personal chat to create some uh, videos for private wealth management so i've got some time today so let's get started this is going to be a really quick one <clears throat> Okay, so from a, uh, uh, from my experience of giving some mocks and uh, the earlier exams, I've collated some points. Uh, don't rely on only these points. Uh, make your own notes. This is just for the last minute revision. So let's get started. So in the question, whenever it is mentioned to quantify or prioritize the goals or tell us what is the priority goal or the non-priority goal, so you mention both those goals and also mention the positives and negatives of both the goals, right? You just don't mention only the positive part, mention both the positive and the negative part of those goals, right? If, if the priority is not correct, so you have to highlight that the priority is not correct for that goals. Right? So suppose the priority is to fund the vacation home and not the retirement. So that is a negative point. Uh, so you can highlight that as part of the answer. So most of the answers will ask you to comment on the priority on the quantification of the goals. So you have to mention both the positive and the negative part. The next part is the capital sufficiency analysis, whether the uh, the individual is going to maintain the lifestyle or is going to maintain a funded retirement account. So there are multiple ways to do it. One is the deterministic model and the other one is the Monte Carlo. The deterministic model has uh, uh, an advantage that it has a single rate of growth, which is which makes the model quite simple to uh, understand. But that also is the disadvantage of this model because uh, obviously you cannot have a single rate of growth. It will keep on changing as per the market forces. So that it fails to accommodate. But uh, it accommodates a lot of other things. The deterministic model can accommodate the impact of taxes, inflation and fees adjustments. And what it does, it basically it projects the future value of the investment basis the above inputs and arrives at a success or a failure probability. So if uh, based on the inputs, it comes uh, comes up with a number that uh, there's a 95% probability of achieving the desired goal based on the inputs and based on the rate. So that is that is done by the deterministic model. Very simple. Uh, and Monte Carlo, we all know that it can take various attributes and run a probability distribution and come up with uh, uh, a series of uh, output, right? So it gives you a distribution, not a single point and not a single number. It gives you a distribution at to, as to what will be your uh, success or failure probability. When the questions ask for the IPS review, understand that ICS, IPS has multiple parts. So the first one is the background that, that will consist of your taxes and objectives. The next is the investment parameters, which will consist of your risk and return tolerance and the information around it. Then the portfolio asset allocation, which consists of SAA, which is your strategic asset allocation and the rebalancing parameters and also the TAA in some cases, when it is uh, mostly an HNI portfolio kind of a thing. Then management and implementation as to whether it's a systematic approach or it's a discretionary approach and within discretionary, what is the current SA, what is the probable rebalancing ranges, and then what is the duties of the wealth manager and an appendix, right? So appendix is an extra information which you can provide as part of your IPS, which will consist of your model portfolio, your market commentary, which is basically the macro commentary on the market and the future capital market expectations. So these are the parts of the IPS that you need to remember. Most of the questions that I've seen are on the investment parameters and the uh, objectives objectives of the ips so the most of the questions are coming from these two sections then there are two ways of uh, creating a portfolio one is the traditional approach in which the risk is at the portfolio level right so if i have a portfolio of say 1 million dollar and within that 1 million dollar i have multiple desires i want to buy a home i want to fund the children education and everything but in the traditional portfolio construction, I had only one portfolio and internally, mentally, I used to do all those accounting that I have to deploy this much for education, this much for vacation, home, X, Y, Z. And so the entire risk was at the entire portfolio level. Now the GBI or the gold-based investing, it's a layered construction, right? One million can be 
segregated into four different portfolios of 2.5 million each, uh, 250,000 each, right? And I can have a different risk level for each. I can have a, a desire, which will be a much more higher riskier portfolio. And I am a, have a need, which will be a less riskier portfolio. So my needs are more important. My desires are, or my wish list is something which I am okay to not achieve also, right? But uh, the needs are something that I need to achieve. So both cannot have a single rate of return or the single risk. Then there are types of investors and the types of wealth managers. Mass effluent is just rich. Just uh, rich means they are just rich enough that uh, they are uh, they have been been servicing, getting the service of private bankers. And there are more customers per advisor. And there is heavy use of technology. And there is absolutely no customization. So there will be a single portfolio type. Say suppose uh, there are two employees. One is in a bracket of say. A, a, 500,000 the other is in the bracket of 1 million in terms of salary but uh, the portfolio manager must have designed portfolios for a range of 500 to 1 million and both will have the same portfolio right because uh, in terms of the portfolio in terms of the portfolio manager they are uh, uh, less significant in terms of the wealth 500 to 1 million so both will have a same portfolio and there will be no customization as such there will be pre-designed portfolio and based on your uh, net worth based on your risk questionnaire score you will be assigned a portfolio. High net worth individual is less clients per wealth manager, tailored advisory, derivatives may be included. Ultra <clears throat> high net worth individuals are like, uh, say, suppose, uh, you know, Bill Gates, Warren Buffet, Elon Musk, right, these guys, where the wealth planning is done for multiple generations, right? It cannot, they cannot uh, have a, a very short term view because there's so much of wealth which needs to be distributed, taken care of. And uh, it has to be, you know, it, it's always uh, very, very useful to uh, have a very structured way of managing such kind of wealth. So there are large family offices which do this. So those guys who are managing this uh, kind of portfolio are known as family office. So in case you come across this word, you will come to know about uh, what do family offices actually do. Basically run the office of the entire family, the portfolio office, right? The portfolio management office. And next is the robo advisory. It is use of technology for extremely generalized portfolio, maybe mean variance optimized. So robo advisory is again very close to mass effluent, but over here the, there's no human involved. It's based on the technology. The technology is uh, coded in such a way that it will take the inputs and come up with the portfolio, right? Okay, so then we have the, uh, the ways to get rid of the concentrated uh, position by private owners. And there are two ways. You can either dilute yourself or you cannot uh, you can still retain the part of equity and still have a lesser exposure. So personal line of credit secured by issues, there is no dilution. The strategy is known as equity monetization. Leverage recap, wherein there is a phased exit. Mostly you retain 40% and sell off 60% to private equities. Then ESOP, wherein you create a share of uh, a pool of shares that you distribute to your employees. So obviously there will be some dilution. Mortgage financing again an equity monetization technique wherein there is no dilution for the user uh, for the owner. Mortgage finance is very simple. You must be aware of it wherein you put your uh, property or anything else as a mortgage and you take loan against it. Then there is something called as a donor advised fund or a charitable re remainder trust, which is again will go into the dilution. So what it is a charitable remainder trust. So we have written over here. I'll just highlight that. Over here, you commit a sh the shares to an irrevocable trust and receive tax deduction. The trust then sells the stocks with no tax implication because the trust is a charitable trust, so it has no tax. And the proceeds are given to beneficiaries. The remainder remains with the trust. So suppose I want, I have a $50 million portfolio and I don't want to sell it and pay taxes on it and then have my children uh, take the post-tax amount. What I will do is I'll create a trust with this as a charitable remainder trust. I'll tell them, okay, this is my $50 million. Take this. Since it is a tax-free entity, they will not be taxed. And while giving it to them, I'll tell them, okay, you take this 50 million, but make sure that 45 million out of it, which should reach my children. Now, since the trust is tax-free, uh, there will be no taxes and the 45 million will be transferred to the children tax-free. Trust gets to keep the 5 million. That's just a hypothetical scenario. Moving ahead, uh, in the last year we had a lot of formulas over here, but we, in this year we have only a single formula, which is whether to gift now or uh, do a bequest. And it is again in two terms, gift 
when it is tax free and when the gift is uh, taxable so it's very simple in this sense just don't get confused by this just always remember that whenever you are getting a return you'll always have to pay a tax on the income right so if it is tax if the gift is tax free you don't have to pay anything but the estate will also get some return and the state will also pay some taxes the state will also pay some taxes just remember this thing that the estate will always pay taxes so the denominator is same in both the cases the estate will always pay taxes in the numerator if the gift is tax free there will be nothing over here but if the gift is taxable you just have to multiply with the tax impact of the gift that's it so very simple in that sense if the ratio of this uh, this thing is greater than 1 it is greater than 1 that means gifting now is a better option if the ratio of gift to bequest is greater than 1 that means gifting now is a better option and if it is less than 1 that means uh, doing a bequest of this uh, estate is a better option right because the denominator is greater then there are types of insurance life term and permanent uh, let's go through it permanent can be termed as whole life or universal so very confusing uh, in the book if you read on paragraphs on paragraphs i have tried to summarize the whole life and universal are similar in most of the sense but uh, there's one basic difference that the whole life the policy cannot be cancelled as long as the premium is paid but in universal the policy cannot be cancelled even if the premium is skipped as long as the cash value is greater than the term insured as long as the cash value is greater than the term insured so that is the only difference whole life and universal then we'll come to npci and nsci which is the net payment payment cost index and net surrender cost index very simple i have defined five steps for it first compute the future value of all premiums by keeping your calculator at beginning then compute the future value of all dividends put your calculator at end state for calculating the tvm then uh subtract both of them then you'll get the net future value this is for the npci then compute the pmt from the face uh, future value and then divided by the par value of the insurance so the steps remain same over here for nsci also but in the net surrender cost index what you are doing you are surrendering the insurance you are surrendering your residual insurance so over here when you are doing the future uh, the net fv you also have to deduct the cash value because that is the value that you are not going to get because you are already surrendering your policy so if you die tomorrow you are not going to get anything that is the cash value which has already gone out of your insurance that is why you are, uh, that is why it's not uh, eligible you are not eligible for that because you have already surrendered the insurance hence you uh, remove the cash value over here uh i have done some sums below but yeah it's not that difficult you can just look at this in the book It's very simple. Now remember the steps: compute future value of all premiums from the beginning, dividends at the end, subtract them, compute the PMT from the FV, and divide it by the par value. Then we have multiple models in our uh, applica uh, in our uh, topic: Norway, Yale, Canadian, and liability based. So Norway is simple: 60/40, no AI, tight tracking error. Yale uh, endowment is high AI, externally managed assets. externally managed manage assets so you can remember the externally ma managed assets is starting from e endowment is starting from e so endowment and ema goes hand in hand then we have the canadian pension and over here we have in house experts who are managing so internal asset management both are in ai liability based is simple that we have read read across in the fixed income also focus on surplus optimization and recognize liability as part of the investment very easy in that sense remember norway 60 40 tight tracking error mostly passive yale endowment is high ai externally asset uh, externally managed asset endowment is equal to ema you can just remember that way endowment starts with e ema starts with e so whenever there is an external management uh, externally managed assets questions are coming so you have to mark it as yale endowment then there are type of funds we have budget development savings reserve and pension reserve so whenever you come across anything like pension reserves or uh something like uh, reserve okay so always remember that these are managed by the uh banks and ministry together right so in the questions they will they will try to 
put both this data within that pension reserve is something which is based on the pension funds right pension the word itself should tell you that pension reserve means it is based on the pension assets so pension assets are always long term so it will be always long term maximum allocated to pe ai and real assets why because these are the assets which will provide uh, you know multifold returns in long term then reserve funds reserve funds are like you know funds of the central bank like reserve bank of india or federal banks of us australia whatever whatever so these guys they cannot do a lot of uh, risky business right so they usually do you know investment in high yield assets which are very very well backed by large corporates or sovereign governments or they invest in multi multilateral bonds international bonds supranational bonds and so on and so forth savings fund savings fund save, when you do savings you say you save it for the uh, future right so the savings funds are uh, those who are investing in the non renewable assets they are investing in the non renewable assets have a extremely long term horizon development funds development is always done in the real assets like infra land power you know minerals or so on and so forth so development will be directly invest into projects like airports dams rivers etc etc and budget funds as the name says it's a budget fund so they are basically focused on the commodity or the natural resources and their maximum allocation is to cash and the bonds because they cannot afford to lose money at all so budget funds because it's it's a budgeted fund it, it has a limited capacity to take risk development funds directly into the projects savings fund for future generation mostly reserve funds uh, mostly by central banks non risky assets are ignored pension reserve extremely long term and invest in risky assets uh certain points when higher education uh, inflation is given only add it to the real rate do not add the inflation so in the question uh, if the inflation the cpi index and the hcpi which is a higher education index is also inflation is also given don't add both of them add only the hcpi right this is something which i have seen in multiple questions then we have the duration of the equity and the variance of the equity and the percentage change in equity it's very simple you have to just remember i'll again tell this we have done this n number of times equity is equal to asset minus liability just start with this if you forget the formula just put a percentage in front of both of them so percentage change in equity is asset minus liability now we know that equity to asset ratio equity to asset ratio and asset to equity ratio right so you want to know the what will be a change in equity you need to know what will be a change in the entire assets and the liabilities right but what if you have a leveraged uh, balance sheet so you need to know what is the leverage a by e over here stands as m so in the question if you are given equity by asset ratio just reverse that just do a one by that amount whatever is given say suppose e by a is given as 20% right 20% is your equity to asset capital ratio you just have to do like this and 5 will be your leverage ratio a by e right so you just have to multiply this by m and obviously since you are doing this by m you will have to multiply with m minus 1 not 1 minus m remember 1 minus m is not applicable m minus 1 so this will be a percentage change similarly if you want to do the duration again start with the same equity is equal to asset minus liability add a duration word in front of everyone right again you do the same thing multiply by m again multiply by m minus 1 so in case you forget the formula just start like this now the duration is always dependent on both the change of the assets and the liabilities right because it is the entire equities duration the net worth duration so it is dependent on both liability and uh, assets so change in liability liability ytm upon change in asset ytm this is the formula so in case you forget it just remember this thing next is the variance again you start with the same thing equity is equal to asset minus liability i am elongating this thing because it's very important and most of the people forget this so variance of your equity is equal to variance of your assets again assets will be multiplied with m right plus m minus 1 variance of your liability minus 2 times m 
into m minus 1 similar to what we always do for liabilities uh, so for the variance sum standard division of a into standard division of b into correlation of a comma b got it that's that's it for the private wealth and institutional investors points we'll move to the asset allocation and the trading and performance a bit longer video but yeah i hope this will cover most of the part <clears throat> okay so there are multiple approaches to uh, asset allocation the asset only approach is mean variance optimized ways liability relative assets are managed to meet the liability ldi surplus optimization goal based it could be a, you know structured in multiple layers or it could be simply an ldi but only for individuals right i can have a goal that i want to get rid of my home loan my home loan is my liability but it's still my goal so goal can be ldi based also uh in the sums if you are given uh, multiple data points to compute the ut utility always remember that if two portfolio have the same utility then choose with the highest roi safety first ratio and what is roi safety first ratio it is the return minus the required return divided by the variance of the return uh, of variance of the asset and the formula for ut utility is very simple it's given in the book and we know it from l1 itself for optimal asset allocation choose the portfolio with the highest sharp ratio also remember if variance is given in decimal if variance is given in decimal so earlier if the variance is was given as 5 now the variance is given as 0.05 uh five is already taken so we'll take something else as 0.07 if the variance is given in decimal use the coefficient as 0.5 right this 0.005 is expecting that the variance will not be in decimal but and even the expected return but if any any one out of both of them is given in decimal so either you convert it into non decimal like this if this is given you convert it into 7 or if you want to use it as is then convert this 0.05 into 0.5 otherwise you'll get a wrong answer so even after knowing the formula you'll get a wrong answer okay there are multiple ways to do asset allocation we earlier discussed this mvo is uh uh mean variance optimized portfolio we know that portfolio allocation is basis the risk and return and the covariance and correlations of the assets reverse mvo we start with the globally diversified portfolio which has a uh, a good diversification which is uh, which is assumed as a good diversification using that diversification we do a reverse mvo and we get to the implied returns and using that implied returns we again generate the mvo so this will give you a much more filtered mvo a much more unbiased mvo the black letter man is an extension of reverse mvo wherein we are doing the same thing the same steps but over here what we am doing that we are allowing you to change this return the implied return which the system has generated the black letter man model allows you to change the returns as per your uh, requirement and it can also be because a unique uh, circumstances or the, uh, there is unique constraints for each of the customer right so they can uh, change those uh, implied returns and implied constraints over there what are the limitations of mbo gigo garbage in garbage out it uh, comes uh, if the data comes in incorrect the output will be incorrect often leads to concentrated asset allocation if it is unconstrained if it is constrained it might still uh, touch the upper bound of the constraint the uh, the reason is because when mbo is running it is looking only at the return and the risk right so it will try to fetch the asset which has the maximum return per unit of risk so it will try to allocate it most of the uh, allocation ignores the skewness and kurtosis the risk is undiversified obviously because there is an asset concentration over here the risk is obviously undiversified it is a single period model always remember this very important from an exam perspective and ignores liability again remember this it is single period and ignores liability monte carlo simulation can model taxes remove concentration of assets can accommodate customer unique preferences so in short monte carlo simulation can do most of the items that most of the models cannot do and uh, the reason for that is monte carlo simulation itself is uh, an iterative model right so it can run into multiple iterations to uh, give you the output uh, then we have the uh, risk contribution or risk attribution methods mctr which is the marginal contribution to the total risk is simply the beta into the standard deviation of the portfolio risk and actr is simply the weight of that asset into the mctr right so uh, the question could be asking you for what is the optimal allocation right the optimal allocation is the ratio 
of the excess return to the MCTR and it is equal for all asset classes. The ratio of excess return to MCTR, excess return, portfolio return minus benchmark return divided by MCTR. So when these two become equal, that is the optimal allocation. After that, even if you add more money to the same asset class, you will not get more results because that is the optimal point of your portfolio to give any more return even if you take more risk in the portfolio. So the point at which the excess return ratio to the MCTR is equal for all asset classes that is the optimal point of your portfolio. Very simple just don't get intimidated by this in the exam if you are just asked MCTR just put it like this beta you just know the beta into portfolio risk standard deviation. not into portfolio risk itself means standard deviation right for your understanding I put that in bracket and obviously once you know the MCTR you know the weight of each of the asset you can combine the uh, compute the ACTR uh, simple statements ignore that yeah then we move to the uh, trading cost and trading performance analysis so in the trading cost implementation shortfall is basically the paper return minus the actual return that is the gross return paper based minus the net returns actual and in uh, BIPs obviously you'll have to divide it by the original investment amount. So let's take an example over here where the decision price is 20 this is from the book itself. Uh, we know that the paper return will be what paper return will be 20.55 minus 20 because addition was just 20 and the closing price is 20.55. So we know that paper return is this, actual profit is this, fees is sim this, quite simple in that sense, I'm not going to repeat this, this is from the book, but in case uh, you want to remember certain points over here, what I really wanted to highlight is, whenever you are given such a sum, always break, if you have time, break it into these variables, if you don't break it into these variables, and if the question is asking only for the shortfall, you don't need to break it into these variables, right? But if the question asks you um, what, was the de uh, what was the impact of the delay cost, then you'll have to break it into these many variables. If the question is only asking you for the implementation shortfall, don't go over here. Just do a simple paper return minus actual return. Just do a simple paper return minus actual return, which will give you this four step answer. Otherwise, you'll have to come into these many steps, which is the delay cost, trading cost, opportunity cost, fixed fees. So the delay cost is simply arrival minus the decision price. Just remember, look at the chain. Arrival is the first one over here. Arrival is the second. So the chain is maintained, right? The chain is maintained. So the arrival minus decision is your delay cost. Execution minus arrival is your trading cost. Opportunity cost is the cost which cost for the stocks which were not uh, executed. And fees is something very simple into the uh, flat fee into the number of shares. Add all of them and you'll get the total cost and divide by the original investment amount. You'll get it in the BIPs. You can see we have got the same answer using both the methods. So if only implementation shortfall is required, just do this in three steps. If uh, it, it asks you to break it down, obviously you'll have to do this. Then we have the uh, simple cost, cost in BPS. Just consider this as cost in BPS. In the books, they are written different, different things. So you know that whenever you're buying, it will always be plus. So always add plus for the buying, minus for the sell. And it will ask you what is your absolute cost it will ask you what is the absolute cost you know if you buy bought a share say suppose you have bought the share at 25 rupees but you wanted to buy that share at 20 rupees right you wanted to buy that share at 20 rupees so what is and suppose you wanted to buy 100 shares so what is your cost cost is 500 rupees right the cost of not acting fast or the cost of the market moving against you was 500 rupees so it's as simple as that so when they ask you trade cost trade absolute cost this is the absolute cost but when they ask you in BPS what you have to just do is basically remove this thing and multiply it by that thousand ten thousand because it's in BPS and divide by the benchmark price right so suppose I'll take this example over here uh, B62 61 minus 62 yes say suppose now I wanted to buy a stock at uh, say 25 okay 
uh, I ultimately bought it at 30. So what will be my cost? Very simple into the number of shares that I want to buy. So my opportunity cost is 500. The trade cost is 500 rupees, right? But what will this be in BPS? It will be simple 30 minus 25. And in percentage term, BIPS means percentage. What was my original this thing? Let's say it's 20%. And just multiply this with 10,000 to get it in BIPS. So sure we've already done the percentage. Yeah. I'm taking a bigger amount here. Let me just remove it and take a smaller amount. Yeah. 320 bips will be my trade cost. So it is simple. This is in absolute terms. This is in bips terms. Absolute, it was an 80, uh, 80 cents cost. In bips term, it was 3.20 percentage. 3.20 percentage. 320 means 3.20 percentage. Got it. Nothing different. So the cost of buying the stock 80 cents above is hampered my return by 3.2 percent. That is it all what it's saying. Simple as that. Uh, then we have the concept of market adjusted cost. So market adjusted cost. Why do we do market adjusted cost? It is to reduce the impact of market momentum on buying and selling. That is adjusting the cost for the market momentum. This ensures trader is not penalized for general volatility in the market. So suppose you are a trader for a very large fund and you have subscriptions coming in. Say you have 1 billion subscription which has come in. Now as a fund manager or as a trader, you have to deploy this cash into the market. But the market is showing an extreme volatility, right? And you wait for one day, two day to the volatility to go down, but it doesn't go down. So the cash drag is happening on your portfolio. So now you decide to invest in the market. Now, suppose you bought the stock at uh, say 20 and five minutes later, it's available at 15, right? So you had all the good intentions and all the market research saying that 20 is the best price to buy the stock. But five minutes later, it is available at a cheaper price. Now, this is not because of the manager's uh, skill, lack of skill. It is because of the market volatility. The VIX will be very high. The volatility index will be very high. So to remove or the penalization of the manager because of this market movement, you do a market adjusted cost, which is simply arrival cost minus beta into the index cost. And what is the index cost? Index cost is again index VWAP minus index arrival divide by index arrival and again into 10,000 to make it in bips. Once you get the index cost, you just minus it from the arrival cost. Minus beta times the index cost. That is your market registered cost. So whatever, say suppose uh, your trading cost is 5.2% but your market registered cost is 3.2%. So the fund manager will be penalized only for 2% because this is the market adjusted cost. The market movement has cost, uh, caused a movement of 3.2%. Originally, the fund manager's skill, due to the fund manager's lack of skill, the loss was only 2%. But because of the market's volatility, the loss has become to 5.2%. So this 5.2% is overall loss. 3.2 is the market adjusted cost and this will get reduced. This is the manager's penalization got it uh, I think so that's it for this so no we have something more down okay that's just a sum that we have solved oh there's a lot of things to go great Oof. okay okay we'll come to the performance analysis now which is the BHB method which is the uh, Brinson Hood BV Bauber method. I think so. That's the name. Yeah, I think so. So BHB always remember it's a three letter model. So the three letter model is very simple. It has an allocation effect wherein you have a weight of portfolio minus weight of benchmark into the return of benchmark. Always remember outside the bracket it is benchmark. No, it never gets multiplied with the portfolios attribute. It is always benchmark. Return of benchmark. In the second one it is the weight of the benchmark and interaction is obviously a mixture of both. BHB is very simple, extremely simple. So when you do BHB, you do BHB when it is a granular level. It is a gran granular level or a security level attribution. 
But if it is a sector level attribution, you follow the BF method, which is the Brinson Falcher method. Brinson Falcher method, or whatever name you can call it. Right. So when it is a granular level, you use the BHV method. When it is a sectorial level or a country level, you use the BF method. The only difference is these two formulas are same. The only difference is rather than multiplying with the benchmark return, you multiply with the benchmark return for that sector minus the entire benchmark return. So that will give you the allocation effect. Also remember if interaction effect is to be combined with selection effect, then selection effects formula will change. If interaction effect and selection effect is to be combined, then the formula will change. The only change will be the outer Outside the bracket, it will be multiplied with the portfolio weight, not with the portfolio of the benchmark. See, notice the change in weight. We now consider the portfolio weight, WP. Over here, it was WB. And we had two different formulas. But if you want to combine selection and interaction effect, selection interaction effect, it will be simple RP minus RB into weight of the portfolio. Then we have test of a benchmark quality. Portfolio return is equal to market plus style plus active. We all know what is my active return. Active return is portfolio return minus benchmark return, right? I have one term over here. I got the A term. P is already given. I need to know B. What is B? B will be my benchmark return. So if I know these terms, I can compute the S terms. S will be my B minus M. What is B? B is my benchmark. M is the market, the index itself. S is the return due to style. A is the return due to the active operations of the fund manager so in the question you can ask you what is the return due to the style it will be b minus m simply benchmark return minus market index return and if they ask you what is the return due to the active uh, management of the fund manager it is as simple as that p minus b okay we have some sharp ratios that we have seen all our life but let's go through it sharp ratio is a portfolio return minus risk rate upon standard deviation Trainer is similar to sharp ratio, but it takes the beta of the portfolio, only considers the market risk, information risk. Information ratio is active return upon active risk, which is RP minus RB into standard divided by standard deviation of the same. Appraisal ratio is very important. It is the active return divided by the volatility of the residual term. Active return, which is the alpha, divided by the volatility of the residual term. Sortino is RP minus R target divided by the downside deviation only. Capture, you all know, upside capture ratio and downside capture ratio. Again, in this, remember that if you are given the capture ratios, your upside capture ratio, if greater than 100 is better, downside capture ratio less than 100 is better. So in this scenario, out of these two portfolios, this is a better portfolio because it has a 100% plus upside ratio and 100% less downside ratio. Capture ratio greater than one is a convex, pro convex profile better. Right, capture ratio greater than one, capture ratio greater than one. Then in the investment manager selection, there is two types of errors. Reta type one, retaining underperforming manager. Type two, firing a performing manager. Or, or not hiring a qualified or performing manager. When you not hire someone what is what will you incur you will incur the opportunity cost because you lost the opportunity what the fund manager could have pre got from the market right he could have outperformed the market so in the question it will given you it will be given to us that which type of manager will be responsible for the opportunity cost it will be type 2 because it's not been hired then there are three three types of fees base plus performance sharing both positive and negative symmetrical so in the question they might just say which is a symmetrical fee type just select this simple greater of base or base plus performing performance sharing unsymmetrical and again this is the third type which is having uh, sharing only up to a limit unsymmetrical nothing really great you have to just go through it i had to rush up on on this one because this is a revision video Obviously, in case you have any doubts, you can just put it in the comments and if I get time, I'll be able to reply to this. Thank you, guys. Bye.